Okay, I think we can get started. Um, got a good uh, a good amount of folks in, and late late. Um, Late twenties can catch up, no problem. Um, well, hello everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us on what we hope will be a series of webinars, giving you updates on the work being done to make ALS livable for everyone, everywhere. <laughs> Excuse me, until we can cure it. For those of you I haven't met, I'm Jeremy Holden. I'm a member of the ALS Association's communication team, and I'm also the host of the Connecting ALS podcast, which you can listen to and subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts. But today, I get the privilege of being your host and MC. So some quick background, on March 22nd, the FDA's Central and Peripheral Nervous System Advisory Committee will convene to discuss the new drug application for Tofersen, an antisense oligonucleotide drug targeting mutations in the SOD1 gene under the agency's accelerated approval pathway. A few weeks ago, as many of you know, the ALS Association filed public comments with the advisory committee, which you'll probably hear referred to today as the ADCOM, uh, in support of making Tofersen available for people with ALS linked to a mutation in the SOD1 gene. In a moment, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Neil Thacker, Chief Mission Officer at the ALS Association, who's going to walk us through how Tofersen fits into our strategy to make ALS livable and how the association came to the decision to support approval. After that, we're going to bring on Dr. Timothy Miller, the David Clayson Professor of Neurology at Washington University in St. Louis and the lead investigator on the Tofersen clinical trials. We'll then turn to Rich Brennan, Vice President of Federal Affairs at the ALS Association for a discussion of what comes next and what you can do to get engaged with the FDA approval process. And we'll wrap things up with a moderated Q&A session. So if you do have questions during the course of the presentations, please enter them in the Q&A chat box down at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible at the end of the hour. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Neil Thacker. Uh, Dr. Thacker, take it away. So thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I wanted to talk to you again about one of the, the central priority for the ALS Association which is to make ALS livable for everyone everywhere until we can cure it, uh, to get that fundamental transformation on what it's like to live with ALS. And so just a reminder about what the association does, uh, we provide support for people living with ALS uh, throughout the country, on the ground in every state. Uh, we lead local and national advocacy efforts to provide better services and to find cures. And then we fund the best research in the world to change the status quo for ALS. And so what we're looking for is, is to make ALS livable. And what does that mean? Uh, it means that people with ALS are gonna have a fundamentally just different experience with ALS than they have today. It means that uh, longer lives, an improved quality of life, and that the folks who share the risk factors, the reasons why they got ALS, those folks get their ALS prevented. And so if you have ALS today, the reasons why you have it, your genes, uh, things in the environment you may have exposed to, uh, those things are shared by people that you love, people you served with, people you grew up with. So prevention uh, is a cornerstone of that. So how are we gonna get there? How are we gonna make ALS livable? Well, we're gonna do three things. Um, we're gonna optimize the treatments and care that we have. We're gonna improve and deliver state-of-the-art care. We're gonna improve assistive technology. We're going to prevent or delay the harms associated with ALS. That means identifying a risk factors and finding ways to lower the risk for people with AL to develop ALS. We're going to discover new preventative treatments, and we're going to treat people as early as possible. And it also means the harms that come with ALS, the infections, the falls, the poverty, the, the burden on families, we're going to find ways to, to mitigate them. And then we're going to find new treatments and cures. Uh, more means we're going to run more clinical trials. We're going to increase the participation in research. And we're going to run research that's more focused on getting results to people as quickly as possible. And as you'll see, that's already been working. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And Tofersen is a part of that path uh, to making ALS livable and a, and a hallmark of this, this success. So let me just give, give a little bit more detail into each of these three issues. When we talk about optimizing current uh, treatments and care, basically we're taking the assumption, even if we don't get another drug approved this year, how can we make um, care better and how can we make the experience of living with ALS easier, make ALS look more livable? And so we, we have some strengths at the association that we can build on. We have direct relationships with everyone we serve. We have high quality 
we in those relationships, the people, uh, our care services staff and our contractors and the people we work with, we can help connect people to high quality care, better benefits, better insurance, uh, that's gonna make a difference. And so that's for the 20,000 people we serve and we're always happy to help serve more people. We're currently reaching about two thirds of the people with ALS in the country. We know that multidisciplinary care is the key to the best care available in the United States. And we've been able to almost triple the number of centers uh, in the country since the ice bucket challenge. Uh, we also know that effective care has to be accessible and has to be affordable. And so we're directly working with payers to make sure ALS treatment is covered. Uh, we're supporting legislation in all in states and at the federal level um, to help make care uh, more accessible and, and affordable. Since January alone, we've been supporting 255 uh, different bills across the states on these issues. As an example, uh, Medigap insurance, uh, we're working on bills in five different states. One, uh, we're just awaiting signature uh, that would require insurers to offer Medigap insurance to people on Medicare who are under 65. That includes people with ALS, so they can get uh, more affordable, more effective coverage. Uh, we've been also working on something that's relatively new and, and a little bit complicated called copay accumulators. Uh, and that means when you get a copay reimbursement card from uh, your, your, your drug manufacturer, that those copays actually benefit you and you alone. And the insurance company doesn't find a way to not count those towards your deductibles. Um, over 60% of health insurance uh, marketplace policies have these policies that, that let them um, take more money out of that copay process and uh, reduce your out-of-pocket benefits. And uh, we're working on bills right now in 16 states and probably expanding that as well. And we're also working really hard uh, to prevent or delay the harms associated with ALS. And so let me take that part. Uh, prevention itself in its most classic sense, stopping people from getting the disease is something that the association has been leading the way on for a number of years now. Uh, last year, we funded six projects on prevention research alone, uh, and we committed 2.4 million uh, in funds to do so. I think we're the first philanthrop philanthropy to, to do that. Uh, we're also supporting bills to include coverage for genetic testing in 18 states. And so that means if we want to identify risk for ALS, we got to know the genes. And if we want to treat those genes, uh, people with those genes, uh, we, we need to get people um, to understand their genetic status. So we've been working on financial coverage for those in a number of states. We've been also um, supporting non-discrimination bills. So if you do know your genetic status, it can't be used against you by an insurance company or a life insurance company uh, in three states. And we've been opposing another bill that would roll back some premium protections for folks based on their genetic status. And then also really importantly, we're working hard to prevent the harms that come with ALS, the isolations, the infections, and the poverty. And so ALS is bad enough, but on top of that, there are human factors, human systems that make ALS a whole lot worse. And so our chapters offer benefits coordination. They offer all kinds of different support. And so if you haven't already, uh, we, I would hope your, our care services staff can, can help you. Uh, we, for an example, we have a contract with the Patient Advocate Foundation that offers uh, support to help people negotiate complex financial issues, insurance issues that come uh, with ALS. Uh, we, we found uh, just not even full data for 2022, uh, over 600,000 in savings uh, for families who are using that helpline. And that's only a subset of the people we serve. There's a lot more, I think, that can be done there as we, we expand that service. And then finally, I wanted to talk about finding new treatments and cures. The association, as part of our effort to make ALS livable, has a relentless focus on the speed and impact of ALS research. It's important for us. It shapes how we think about our funding. We think not only about, is this research gonna make a big change for people with ALS, but also is it gonna make a fast change? When is that impact gonna occur? And we're constantly balancing the, the length of the research, the cost of the research and the, the benefit of the research so we can get changes fast. 
it's important for the NIH too. They issued a, a, in a couple months ago, a strategic plan for ALS and that, that plan is great. It's got a lot of strong points to it, but it doesn't really address the time element. It doesn't think through the time element. And that's a concern for us. And so we've been working with Congress and NIH to work with the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine to quote, identify and recommend key actions for the public, private and nonprofit sectors to undertake to make ALS a livable disease within a decade. So to get them to focus on time as well. And so as part of our research program, we've been working on ways to get more drugs under study, to get those uh, drugs tested faster, to get more people engaged in ALS care. And that's working. Uh, and so think of the timeline for, for treatments. Uh, we had in 1995, uh, the first ALS drug approved, Roliazol. It took 22 years to get to the next drug, Radicava, in 2017. And then only five years to get to the next drug after that, Relibrio, in 2022, the first drug to come out of um, ice bucket funding. So now we have a new drug that's up for consideration by the FDA. Uh, I'm hoping it will get approved. And so that would just be one year to the next drug. So it does mean there's some evidence to suggest here that the timing between uh, drug approvals is getting faster. And I don't know for sure if that's going to keep happening, but we do know for sure that we're doing everything we can to make that happen. And so with that, uh, I'm very excited to turn things over to Dr. Miller to talk about uh, a new um, drug to a person. Okay. Can you see the screen? Okay. All right. Perfect. Well, I'm uh, delighted uh, to be able to have the opportunity to discuss uh, tofersin with you for SOD1-related ALS. Before I get started, I want to uh, highlight some of my industry collaborations, in particular Ionis Pharmaceuticals, with whom I've had the pleasure of developing antisense oligonucleotides, and tofersin is one of those antisense oligos, and also Biogen, with whom I've had the pleasure of running clinical studies, and the study that I'm going to talk about today was run with Biogen. I think as many of you know, um, uh, most of ALS is singleton, or meaning there's one person who has it in the family or often referred to as sporadic, and 10% of ALS is familial. If we take a, a closer deep dive into that familial component, that 10%, 10 to 20% of the familial ALS is because of mutations in the SOD1 gene, or if you do the math, overall, one to 2% of, uh, of ALS. SOD1 is superoxide dismutase 1. It causes 1 to 2% of ALS, as I just mentioned. It's a genetic change, a change in the DNA, a one-letter uh, change um, that leads to this mutation. It's typically not associated with dementia. And there's toxicity to neurons, the motor neurons in particular, uh, from the abnormal protein that's produced. Tofersin is designed to lower the levels of SOD1 RNA and therefore protein. To understand um, uh, tofersin, really need to take it back to high school biology and talk about DNA, RNA, and protein. You can think of the DNA as a blueprint, a set of instructions for how to build a human uh, body and how to maintain that human body. Or if we use an example of a house, make it a little bit easier to understand how to build a house, um, for example. Uh, in that, the DNA is a set of instructions, but it's also, it's kind of complicated, hard to use. And, and RNA is another set of instructions rewritten for how to, like a pamphlet, for example, for how to build and, and maintain a living room. And the stuff that's in that living room, we think of those as, as the protein. So that would be the chair or a rug, or maybe a, a brick in, uh, in the wall that would be used to support um, that uh, uh, living room. So and you have an abnormal uh, uh, gene, so a change in the genetic code of the DNA that leads to a change in the RNA or abnormal RNA. And that abnormal set of instructions leads to uh, a buildup of toxic proteins that are a problem for the cells. In this another way, again, the DNA is this genetic code, but there's a mistake in there that gets it's put into the RNA, which is a rewritten part of that. And instead of building a regular brick that looks like this, it's not there. You um, end up putting in an abnormal brick, something that's misshapen. And that um, 
the shape in brick. So over the course of time, in the beginning, it's it's not a problem. That's what we think people born with these mutations, they're okay. But over time, this toxic protein builds up, this uh, um, abnormal shape. If you break as you can think about it, leads to uh, the destruction. And so, so when we think about how do antisense oligonucleotides work, they um, uh, block the abnormal RNA. You can think of it as an eraser. It's this set of instructions for making RNA. Tofersen goes in and um, erases that set of instructions for that abnormal RNA. If there's not abnormal RNA, then there's not the uh, levels of abnormal protein. So what do we see in the phase three SOD1 antisense oligonucleotide study named VALOR, and also talk about the OLE or the open label extension? Couple of points, SOD1 itself was lowered. You'd expect that, that's what this drug is designed to do. Neurofilament, a marker of neural damage was reduced. And I'll talk a bit more about that, but to me that implies that we've slowed down neurodegeneration. The primary endpoint, slowing of disease on a functional scale, was not met at 28 weeks. But the data, when we look further out at 52 weeks, did show that people on tofersen appear to stabilize and may even be um, showing signs of improvement. So to take you through that, um, this is the study design. I think the, the important parts are here that in, there are three doses given in the first month where these are the days and these are the doses. So three given in the first month, and then another dose given about once a month after that for the rest of the study. There were 72 people that were on tofersen and 36 on placebo. If you give this kind of drug, tofersen and other antisense oligonucleotides, into the blood, it does not get into the brain and spinal cord, which it needs to to treat ALS. It does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So these kinds of drugs are delivered intrathecally, and I'll explain what that means. So in, in green here is the cerebral spinal fluid, the fluid that bathes the brain and spinal cord, goes all throughout the brain and spinal cord. And we can access that through a needle in the back, as shown going in here, so in between these bones, needle in the back that goes into this fluid-filled space in the bottom of the uh, spinal column, and the drug is um, injected into that space, into the cerebral spinal fluid that bathes the brain and spinal cord and distributed throughout the brain and spinal cord, so intrathecally delivered. I also want to talk about the open label extension. So at 28 weeks, everyone had an opportunity to go on drug. We don't know who was on initially on placebo or who was on drug initially, but all the participants at 28 weeks were allowed to go on drug. And 88% of the people in this study chose to do so. Okay, so here's some of the results. <clears throat> to orient you to these and a couple of other slides, um, in blue are the placebo. So they, they got put the placebo first, shown here. And then at this line here, 28 weeks, they were able to get on drug. So starting here, they're all on drug. In red are those that are on, we call them early start tofersen, or they start on tofersen from the beginning and then continued on tofersen throughout the study. And this is showing that the SOD1 protein was reduced. Again, this is what's causing disease. This is what this drug is designed to do, lower the RNA, lower the levels of protein. So this is a good sign. Now, how are we gonna understand the effects of lowering of SOD1 protein? One way to look at this is through uh, neurofilament. Neurofilaments come in three different flavors shown here. We've got heavy, medium, and light. Light and heavy have been studied most in the setting of ALS. Neurofilaments are structural proteins. They're the proteins in these axons. Axons are the connections between the nerve cells and the muscles. So a cell that goes from your spinal cord or your brain out to the, the muscles called motor neurons. And neurofilaments are an important part of the structural structure, the structure of these axons. When they're damaged in the setting of ALS, they leak out and end up in the cerebral spinal fluid and also the blood. <clears throat> and in, in an ALS, these levels are particularly high. So shown in here is ALS and a number of other neurodegenerative diseases. You don't need to uh, read or understand the names of all these. You'll recognize Alzheimer's disease, a Parkinson's disease, for example, where it's elevated compared to here control, it's up, but not like an ALS where it's up uh, uh, quite a bit. So um, neurofilaments are particularly elevated in the setting of ALS. They also predict survival. This is one of a dozen 
maybe many more than a dozen figures that I could have shown to illustrate the relationship between neurofilament levels and progression rates or survival. So here's the people surviving 100% at the beginning. Here's time on this x-axis. And now you see that those with a lower neurofilament are surviving longer, and those with a higher neurofilament surviving a shorter amount of time. So neurofilament tied to pro progression rate, neurofilament tied to survival. So how about in this study? <clears throat> Again, here's time on the x-axis, so weeks since uh, uh, starting the study. And then here's the, the neurofilament levels. And this is normalized to each person's baseline value. So 100% when they started, and then what was it uh, during the course of the study? And you can see that those that were on uh, the tofersin from the beginning, their neurofilament levels go down substantially. And if you're on placebo, doesn't change much. We wouldn't expect it would. Doesn't usually change over the course of ALS. When they get on drug, their neurofilament levels come down as well. The fact that we're lowering neurofilament so tightly linked to survival, so tightly linked to progression rate, linked to axonal damage. My interpretation of these data is we have, as we have had a substantial effect on the neurodegenerative disease process, we've really uh, gone a long way towards putting out the, the fire here and uh, slowing down neurodegeneration. So what was the effect on the, um, on the clinical outcomes? We looked at the ALS functional rating scale. Many of you would be familiar with this. It's a 48-point scale, higher values, higher function. There are four subdomains, ball bar, speaking, moving the face, swallowing, fine motor, mainly hands, gross motor, uh, using the legs and uh, walking, breathing um, uh, as well. So these four subdomains, everybody starts out with, uh, with 48. And um, again, this is showing you the change on that scale and then time again on the x-axis. And it's important to point out that this study did not meet the primary endpoint. And these are not exactly the data that were compared. It's, it's easier to show it in terms of this uh, particular figure. But you can see that there is a trend of a difference, this group doing a little better than this group, having declined a little bit less. But this was not statistically significant. This study did not meet the primary endpoint. And I should mention that in a primary endpoint, we really only analyze a subset of the fast progressing group. But what if you look at it 52 weeks? Again, worsening is going down. You, now you see in red, those on early start to first one, stabilizing. Not as much change, a flattening of this curve and this group, again, uh, perhaps beginning to slow down as well. So some stabilization of function at the, at the later time points. This is the handheld dynamometry mega score. So this again is the change from baseline and then this is time. This is when everybody got on a, a drug, placebo, and um, these continued on drug. And what you see, the relatively small numbers, there is some noise in these measurements, but, but what I see here is that there's some improvement from, especially if you look from 40 weeks out to 52 weeks, some stabilization of function um, showing some improvement. We looked into this a, a, a bit further, and uh, this is an impressive number to me. If you look at those on early start uh, tofersin, 27%, if you look from the beginning, zero to 52 weeks, and just ask um, how many people had some sign of improvement of their muscle strength. So this is handheld dynamometry is, is a muscle strength score. And you see that 27% um, uh, had uh, improvement uh, on that measure. And, and I, um, I think as many of you who are listening know quite well, it is uncommon for people living with ALS uh, to improve. It's a relentless, relentlessly progressive disease. In 20 years of, of taking care of people living with ALS, I have not seen improvement. And so this number, again, um, striking. There were overall relatively um, few deaths over the course of this study, though there were fewer deaths in the Tofersen group that's shown here. This, again, is time, and this is the percent surviving. And you see that this red line, that there are um, uh, fewer declines here, uh, fewer uh, um, deaths. So overall, not that many. But if we drill down or think about a, a subset of SD1 ALS, this is the A5V group. A5E, there are more than 100 different mutations in SOD1 that, that cause ALS, but about 50% of the people with SOD1 mutations in the United States have this particular mutation, A5E, and it's rapidly progressive. Um, so this is showing you all other SOD1 ALS, and now here's A5V ALS, again, survival, 
and time. And people survive about a little over a year, typically with this form of ALS. And so can we look at that, this subgroup in the setting of our study? Um, in this, as per the other um, slides, the color scheme in red is the time treated with tofersin, in blue, time treated with placebo. And here there's an additional line of, of time that pe people were on no treatment at all. And the first thing to point out is there are three people in these um, uh, plus signs here who are still ongoing in the study. Um, and then if you look at the group in particular who got early start versus delayed start, so again, this group here, they're surviving 1.9 years. That's about a 50% increase in survival for, um, uh, for that subgroup compared to either the delayed start in this study or uh, the, the natural history of this disease, as we know from uh, many other studies. There were adverse events, and it's, it's important to, to mention that about 80% of people had some adverse event related to the lumbar puncture, often mild. Um, and then there were some serious uh, neurologic events. These in included in a few people in each of these categories, but uh, uh, these were serious, and these are things that uh, we're going to need to continue to follow. Though overall, Tofersen was well tolerated. Some conclusions. Tofersen lowers SOD1 protein in the CSF. Again, good news. This is what we expected it to do. It also lowers the levels of neurofilament. My interpretation of those data is a substantial slowing down of the ALS disease process, substantial slowing down of neurodegeneration. At the later time points, looking out at 52 weeks, there's stabilization of function, stabilization of breathing, which I didn't show you, and, uh, and stabilization of, of strength, and uh, some suggestion of improvement in strength. And then overall, uh, Tofersen was well tolerated, though there are some uh, noteworthy side effects that we will need to continue to follow. What have we learned about all ALS? Many of you listening to this uh, um, may not have an SOD1 mutation. It may not be what's causing ALS in your family, or maybe may you know, your family member is the only person. You're in the singleton or uh, a sporadic um, uh, group. I think one important thing for me as an ALS researcher for the last 20 years is I think we now know that ALS is a treatable disorder. There are other drugs that slow down um, ALS to some extent, but in terms of the data that we see here with evidence of um, improvement, um, this, this drug is really bending the curve. I think that that tells us that, that ALS is treatable, which is fantastic news. Um, for all people living with ALS and for the continued efforts for uh, drug development. We do need the right drug. Tofersen is the right drug for SOD1 ALS. And of course, now we need to find the right drug for other genetic forms uh, of ALS and find the right drug for, um, for all ALS for the sporadic singleton form. Other thing we've learned is it, it may take time to heal. We saw trends at 28 weeks, but it wasn't clear. Um, at 52 weeks, things become much more clear. Perhaps we should have known this from the polio literature and from other uh, nerve injury literature that it, it takes time. But it, um, given time, we do see uh, um, evidence of improvement, evidence of healing. I'll make the prediction that movement of neurofilament uh, um, will be predictive of success or failure. We don't have enough studies to, to know that yet, but I would say that, that that's likely to be true. We're gonna be watching neurofilament more closely in other trials going forward. I should be quick to point out that an effective drug may not change neurofilament. It may not be working at, at, at stabilizing those axons. An example would be a drug that, uh, um, that affects muscle. You wouldn't necessarily expect that it would have an effect on neurofilament, stabilize the axon. It could, it could be good for the motor neuron that you're affecting the muscle, but at first pass, it may not affect neurofilament and may have a huge effect uh, uh, on ALS. I think neurofilament is going to be useful in the real world experience. Uh, we're able to measure neurofilament uh, um, in the clinical lab at Washington University. So we're able to follow this and we are following this in the setting of the expanded access program. Neurofilament is being measured routinely by many labs uh, around the world. And it's going to be helpful um, uh, for us as we think about uh, these kinds of treatments. We do need to know a lot more about neurofilament release as we uh, key in on this and understand that. There are many groups that have supported these studies over uh, uh, many years. These studies really began in uh, uh, 2002, 2003. 
Um, I also want to highlight in particular the study participants. Without these brave volunteers and their caregivers and families, studies like this wouldn't go. We wouldn't be where we are today about uh, understanding uh, neurofilament and understanding uh, tofersin. Um, also want to recognize the principal investigators, their site staff. Uh, these studies end up being a, a huge amount of work. Um, the steering committee, uh, in particular, uh, uh, Merit Sakovich, And then also my colleagues at Biogen, Steph Fredette and uh, Toby Ferguson. I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Miller. That was a, a really great presentation. I also enjoyed the animations too. It's nice to see things explained so clearly. If we could bring up the, the next set of slides, um, what, I, what we'd like to do is go over the association position, some of the uh, issues that are gonna come up, how people can get involved if they're interested in getting involved. And uh, then we can have some general questions. We've already got some great questions in the Q&A and I'm looking forward to hearing your, your thoughts on them, uh, Dr. Miller. And again, if you have more questions, uh, please do um, put them in the Q&A section so we can get to them. I, I wanted to point out, and you may have seen in Dr. Miller's slide, the ALS logo among many other uh, funders who've been supporting this work. We've been involved in this um, technology at least since 2004 over multiple grants. And so we, we may have some sort of um, financial interest that's not quite clear. I just wanna be upfront about all of those sorts of issues. But I think more importantly um, is, you know, as advocates, uh, myself, our research team, our leadership, our volunteer leaders, they, they are all familiar uh, with people who are involved in ALS, all the major ALS research studies, all the phase three studies, we know at least someone and they have uh, their own experience. And on top of that, we desperately, desperately, desperately want to see major changes in ALS care. Uh, very quickly. And so we want every drug to work. And, and I don't think we're unbiased in that. Every drug that comes up for approval, we get very excited about and we really want it to work. And that, that standard, that personal sense of, of hope and um, that intense sense of urgency that we're all working under isn't very helpful to the FDA. So we don't take a position on FDA approval for any drug until we have independent experts review that data and make their own assessment. And then we review that data ourselves, we review their assessment, and then we share it with our scientific advisory committee, which is part of our board, before we come for a decision. Um, that's what we did with the Amelix drug. Um, and that's how we came for the decision to support that drug. Um, that's with the process we went through for Tofersen. And we went through that process and we did uh, come up with a decision to support approval. And that's what we, uh, a message we sent to the FDA I believe uh, last week. If you can go to the next slide, please. So just to summarize where we're at and to hit a very simplistic view of that wonderful presentation from, from Dr. Miller, even though Terfersen uh, failed its primary endpoints, it looks like the trial wasn't long enough to detect the clinical change that seems to be happening. They showed a clear biological effect within three to four months of treatment and then there was a clinical change occurring months later. And then after a year of study, people who got the drug later uh, did worse than people who, did the, who got the drug early. And those findings are, are clear. They seem to be quite robust. And uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, it's, it's fitting the criteria for accelerated approval. And maybe Dr. Miller can talk about that a little bit more. But you know that's a specific way for the FDA to look at this drug. And we have to be mindful that this is not just for ALS, which is a rare condition, but a subset of people who uh, have a particular gene for ALS, maybe 2% of the ALS population. So this is a, a very rare or ultra rare uh, form of ALS. And that requires um, some special thought about how the FDA should review it. Because it's not like they can just say, run another study, and increase the power or increase the follow-up time and then to have that study done uh, quickly. That's really not feasible at all. So we recommend accelerated approval because there's strong biological effect. 
there's a clear link between the biological effect and the clinical effect. That's what Dr. Miller was talking about with neurofilament. Uh, and then this is a very serious disease. There's no effective cures. And to run, as I said before, run a new trial is really hard. What's fortunate is if the FDA wants additional evidence while they go through this accelerated approval process is there is another study that's underway. It's a prevention study. I believe it's the ATLAS study. And that could be the backup information that the FDA may want to look at. Um, but we do recommend that they approve the drug now. So that's, the, um, that's where we're at at the association. And if you go to the next slide, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Rich Brennan, our, uh, our colleague from the advocacy team, to talk about what you could do if you're interested in pursuing this further. Uh, Rich? Great, thank you, Neil. First of all, I just wanna make sure to thank everybody for engaging in this webinar. And without you and without our advocates, um, we wouldn't be able to even conceive of um, approving the, having the FDA approve these and consider these drug therapies. So thank you for your time. Now, everybody that's here, if you care about advancing new drug treatments, the point is that we have an action center and we want you to be able to take action um, whenever possible. So we're going to alert you to opportunities to do so. I cannot emphasize how important it is for policymakers to hear from you. They need to hear from ALS, uh, people with ALS and also their family members to be able to advance these types of treatments. Next slide, please. So this is one of those many opportunities that we are tracking. Um, the FDA actually welcomes co public comments as part of the ADCOM process. So that is also part of this Topherson ADCOM process. Uh, we currently um, have uh, a, a link here that you can um, go to, to provide your own comments, your own story about why a drug like uh, Topherson or uh, new drug treatments in ALS are as important to, to you and to those uh, around you. So we encourage you to please um, make your comments and uh, please do so by March 21st. That's when the um, committee uh, will close the comments. But every comment that will come in will be uh, read by the committee and uh, processed by the FDA as part of their decision. So you actually have a role in this. Next slide, please. We also have various webinars, um, as Neil had said um, from the onset. We have one coming up next week. Um, we have another webinar planned um, to discuss our ALS appropriations efforts for this called fiscal year 20, 2024. We want to make sure that you tune in because there's a number of research uh, efforts uh, at, at the NIH, at the, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, at the Centers for Disease Control, and also the Department of Defense that you're going to want to hear about these. All these departments are are um, are initiating um, studies and uh, initiatives to bring uh, you know these drug these drug tr uh, treatments into reality. So we want to make sure that um, you are aware of those. And lastly, next slide. Um, we also enjoy we invite you to join our advocacy network. You can simply text ALS to eight five five four six nine. 2621. Your voices make all the difference. I really appreciate your time and uh, pass it back to Neil. Thank you. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So the last thing, you, you may be wondering what this means for you. Uh, if you have an SOD1 uh, form of ALS, or if you have family members who do, uh, there's really no way to be sure until you have genetic testing. However, that's a, um, a bit of a complicated issue. Uh, it has some financial implications for the people who are tested. So we do recommend um, counseling and certainly in conversation with your uh, doctor. Uh, we have a website that covers some of these issues, uh, including links to free testing, and then we have a QR code for that. We will have these slides on online uh, for you all um, so you can per peruse those and get all these links at your leisure. Um, so I want to stop here and turn it to Jeremy. I know we've gotten a lot of great questions. If you have more questions, please um, put them into the Q&A chat. 
Uh, yeah, thanks, Neil, and thanks everyone for uh, for all this great information. Uh, uh, Neil, as you mentioned, uh, some good questions in the in the chat. You you, you address one about access to the slides. Uh, those will be posted, uh, and we'll circulate links afterwards. Uh, the 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 um, webinar will also be there for those. I know a few folks that they they came in late, so not only the slides but the full webinar will be available for for later viewing. Um, the uh, uh, Question, uh, I think maybe for you, Dr. Miller, about the test uh, or about the uh, about the clinical trials, uh, and I'm going to kind of combine two here uh, about the role of placebo uh, in, in these trials. Why wasn't everyone given the drug right away? And, and related to that, um, you know, why did some people get the drug later in their course of disease in the trial, and how might that play out in the real world? Maybe those are two. Um... <laughs> related questions. Some people got the drug six months later because they were on placebo. Um, maybe that, that's a part of it. And some people presented later. So, you know, that that's uh, how it plays out in the real world. Um, uh, you know, I hope that there's increasing awareness of, of SOD1 or genetic mutations associated with ALS and that more people will get tested and if appropriate, would get on a, a disease modifying therapy sooner rather than later. You know, for each individual, it's a little bit hard to tell kind of, um, why somebody might have done better or, or not. But if you look at the groups, that those that were started six months earlier as a group uh, uh, clearly did better. And the the kind of placebos in the setting of, of studies is a tricky issue that comes up again and again in terms of how do we clearly demonstrate that um, that there's an effect of a drug like tofersen or, or other drugs that are being tested in ALS and yet give an opportunity for everyone to get on the drug. And that's an ongoing conversation um, and a problem that, uh, that we in the research community um, recognize uh, and that we're doing our best to decrease the number of placebos needed for, um, uh, for each of the studies. Uh, I think somewhat related question. Um, how do you identify or isolate fast progressing AV5 patients in the real world? Well, if someone has an A5V mutation and they're symptomatic with the with ALS, they're probably rapidly progressive. And the vast majority of people with that mutation are rapidly progressive. But the first way to identify them is is what uh, um, what Neil talked about, which is genetic testing. So you'll know whether they're A5V or some other mutation based on the genetic testing. So so that's the first pass way that we would identify people. There are some um, uh, opportunities to use neurofilament to help identify um, uh, rapid progressors as well, though usually we see people a couple of times and then we can tell whether they're rapid or slow. In general, ALS tends not to pick up pace or slow down um, the, over the course of the disease. Uh, another question, I, probably for you, Dr. Miller, um, but uh, you know, assuming Tofersen were to be approved uh, first for SOD1 pre-symptomatic individuals like, like this questioner, whose pathogenic SOD1 mutation is not included within the scope of the ATLAS trial, uh, what are the expectations, uh, especially in the context of neurofilament? Um, so I think that that's going to, first of all, there are SOD1 mutations that are not able to be included in, in, in ATLAS. And I know that uh, for the SOD1 community, that that's hard. Um, I just want to recognize that uh, up front. And I think different clinicians are going to do this in different ways. Right, so I I don't know how each person's going to do it. I can give you my own experience for what you know what we will likely do you know, uh, at, at our center, which is if somebody has an SOD1 um, uh, mutation, we'll be able to follow neurofilament, and we'll be able to so if someone who couldn't be in the Atlas trial, but well, we still can follow their neurofilament. The neurofilament levels are uh, available and can be measured, um, can be measured clinically. And I think we'll also continue to follow people who have SOD1 mutations, known SOD1 mutations, we'll follow them um, uh, uh, clinically uh, to help understand what, whether they're changing. And then there are a number, though ATLAS is an uh, uh, asymptomatic treatment trial, there are a number of um, studies focused on the asymptomatic uh, gene carriers, uh, one that is being run uh, with MGH, Washington University, and Columbia University called uh, Prevent ALS, which really brings together two studies, and then the pre study being run by uh, Michael Benatar at the University of Miami. So there are 
other opportunities to to have even more careful uh, monitoring um, of people who are asymptomatic gene carriers. And if people have questions about that, they can get in touch with me. Great. Uh, Neil, I want to bring you in here of a question. Uh, going back to something you talked about earlier and then the process of determining when the association is going to weigh in on, on drug approval process. And some of the things that they're hearing from people that we serve, a uh, question about why is this different from neuron? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that, Jeremy. It's it's really simple. There's two reasons. So one, neuron is not uh, under active discussion by the FDA for approval. So there's no call for comments from the community about the approval of Neuron. Uh, I understand the company and FDA have been going through some conversation about that. I, I don't know what the results of that conversation are. So I can't, I can't comment on that part. Um, and then the second is we, we haven't been asked to conduct a review. And so until we do, we really don't have a basis um, for commenting on whether the drug works or not. And it really wouldn't be appropriate for me to give a, a substantive answer to you know, what, what I think about the evidence without, without having some expert uh, impartial uh, views uh, into, that, into those studies. Toferson, of course, is in front of the FDA for review. Um, we have a question about with so few people with ALS having this particular gene mutation, what role might that play in the FDA's consideration of, of whether to approve? Dr. Miller, maybe you'd want to talk a little bit um, about accelerated approval and the considerations for uh, a very rare disease. Sure. I mean, I could talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, about both. I think, I'd, again, ahead of the ad comments a little bit, I think we um, it's hard to predict you know, what, what uh, you know, that's why we're having it. That's why we're having a review by the FDA, right, and, and meeting with the advisors. So in general, accelerated approval is, you know, thinking about a, a product for a serious or life-threatening disease or condition. So that's the first step. That seems pretty easy here. ALS is a serious or, and, and life-threatening condition. So I think that check mark will be easy for them. And then, you know, it's determination whether the product has an effect on a surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit, right? And that's the piece that FDA will need to consider in the setting of a neurofilament. They'll be thinking about the biological plausibility of the relationship between the disease and the endpoint, neurofilament, the likelihood to predict desired effect and the empirical evidence that supports uh, that relationship. And again, they're trying to come down on um, reasonably likely. So that's what's before the FDA, that's their charge. Um, and, and that's really language that, that comes from FDA. Um, they do need to make some, you know, special considerations for um, for rare groups, right? You know, how um, how easy is it to do another trial, um, et cetera. Um, I do not have as much experience um, with uh, kind of FDA and trying to understand how that's going to influence their thinking. Um, but again, we will make those points uh, um, to the committee uh, next week. Uh, you, you you touched on this a little bit earlier, uh, Dr. Miller, but uh, just open this up for for everyone. Um, even though this uh, this particular drug is specific to the SOD one gene, is is there any chance it might help people with sporadic ALS, or or are there learnings that can help point the path forward on that? Yeah, well, I think there's definitely learnings. I mean, you know, related to neurofilament, related to the fact that it's treatable, related to the fact that it takes time to heal. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot in here for all ALS trials. People are gonna be analyzing these data and digging through it for years and years to come. And it's gonna have a major influence, I would predict, on ALS trials. But the specific question of is tofersin good for sporadic ALS? I think that's what you're getting at. And um, <clears throat> it's a fascinating scientific question. If you look across neurodegenerative diseases, many of the genes involved in those diseases, you know, that somehow show up in the pathophysiology. So it's fascinating. It's been studied. People have continued to think about it. Um, but I would say from the state of the science right now, um, I would recommend Tofersen for SOD1-related ALS as it was designed and as has been demonstrated in the setting of this uh, uh, clinical trial. Um, that's where I would uh, recommend that uh, Tofersen be used. Um 
question here, uh, Neil, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this one to you about, um, kind of availability of the drug. If it were to be approved, the, what are the next steps in terms of availability and affordability for, for people who this would impact? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Hopefully I expect all of these drugs are, I think they're difficult to make and administer. It's an injection in the spine. That's not something that's simple. Um, so it's going to be, a, I would assume, a challenge, uh, but it's a good problem to have. I'm hoping uh, once the FDA, if they approve it, um, then the, the company will have to talk about how they're going to distribute this drug across the country, uh, who's going to get it, how accessible it's going to be. I, I don't know at this point. And of course, I think people are very concerned that it's going to be expensive. And as all the ALS treatments are very expensive, and I, I don't have any um, special information on that. I do know that we've been aggressive about getting uh, other ALS drugs funded and our care services staff, our um, groups like the Patient Advocate Foundation that I mentioned earlier in the hour, uh, they do work to help people think through their insurance issues and we're gonna continue to do that. Um, but getting high quality care to people with ALS is a challenge now, it's gonna remain a challenge and that's why that slide put up, Rich put up about um, advocating at the state level, advocating at the federal level for better benefits, better care, better coverage uh, is, is really important. Uh, I, wish, I wish we could flip a switch and then everybody gets the treatment that they need when they need it, um, but we're going to have to keep fighting for that. Okay. Can I jump in there as well? Please. Just to, um, just to remind people if they don't know that there is an expanded access program. So the trial finished, we can stop the trial, but people newly identified with SOD1 mutations can get on this drug if they want to, right? It's not, uh, expanded access is a tricky business and, and you guys know about that as well. And not every site is able to do it. So it's not, it's uneven and it's not, uh, um, it can be difficult for participants and also for sites. But there is an expanded access uh, uh, program available right now. So the, um, there shouldn't be any delays for someone newly diagnosed with SOD1 ALS um, who may want to get on this drug right away. And then, of course, the, there will be time that it takes for getting it to the, um, you know, out through uh, regular channels. So the, the best way to find out about that, uh, Dr. Miller, if, if they think there might be benefit, would benefit. Um, so you know, people can contact Biogen um, uh, directly uh, about that expanded access program, and, and Biogen can point them to um, uh, to one of the sites uh, that's available. People could also contact me, you know, to, uh, um, about uh, if they have questions about uh, other sites available, et cetera. We, we want to make sure that newly diagnosed people with SOD1 ALS um, know that they can get on this drug again. It, even some of the even some large ALS centers near people listening to this webinar um, may not be participating in the expanded access program. It's uneven. It's difficult. We get that. But on the other hand, if people are motivated to get on this drug, they can. That, that's uh, great. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned the expanded access program. Uh, leads to a question in the chat. Uh, if Tofersin is not approved, do we know whether the expanded access program will continue until or into the future? Yeah, um, I mean, of course, I, I, I hope that it would. You, you've heard very clearly from me my my opinion about uh, Tofersin and um, and the the anecdotal uh, uh, stories, et cetera, are, are really remarkable too. And you can see that coming through online that people, you know, uh, talking about Tofersin. So you can see from me that I would like to see it, it remain available. I I don't know what. Um, what would happen if uh, if FDA were to not approve this drug? And um, frankly, we've been very focused on on this meeting, and and not focused on um, kind of what to do afterwards. We'll we'll pick up the pieces and and, and figure that out later if need be. I, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, before we wrap things up, uh, maybe we'll try to squeeze in too. Uh, the drug is being administered intrathecally, but it's my understanding that the connections to the muscles are in the peripheral nerves. So does this drug only work on the upper motor neuron systems or does it also work on the peripheral nerves? It, that's, that's a great question. I probably should have explained that better. Motor neurons, 
the cells in the spinal cord that connect to the muscle come out of the spinal cord into the um, nerve roots, out into the peripheral nerves and connect all the way to the muscle. They're directly connected. And so by we are treating the motor neurons in the spinal cord, and those are the ones that are connected to muscle. We are not treating, and that's where the RNA is, by the way, for that cell. Most of the RNA that, that counts uh, for SD1, that's where it is. And so we're targeting exactly what, what we need to, to target in the brain and spinal cord. We do also think we should be targeting upper motor neurons with this, and that the drug is going to get up around the, uh, the cortex and should also be targeting uh, that area too. I, I think that is all the time we have for questions uh, today. Um, uh, Neil, did you have any closing thoughts before we wrap things up? I, I want to thank Dr. Miller uh, for a great presentation and taking time out of a very busy week to do this. And, and I also want to echo your thanks of all the people with uh, SOD1 who volunteered for this study, all Absolutely. their caregivers and family members who helped make it possible for them to participate. They've done a great service uh, for the ALS community, um, for even people who don't carry the gene, in helping us um, hopefully achieve another landmark uh, for ALS treatment. So uh, my, my personal thanks to, to them as well. Well, and I, yeah, thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you, Dr. Thacker. And thank you, Rich, for, for your time and your insight today on, on this process. Uh, we will be sharing more resources uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, and, and again, uh, a link to uh, how you can engage with the FDA on this process. Um, as Rich mentioned, uh, we'll be hosting another webinar next week on the appropriations process. So hopefully people can get that on their calendar. And tune into that as well. Uh, but really want to thank everybody for tuning in and being engaged. Some great questions. If we didn't get to your questions, reach out and, and we'll, you know, we'll try to, oh, I see Rich trying to. Uh, Sorry. And one last thing is just to remind everybody that the ADCOM is next week, Wednesday, the 22nd of March. The decision by the FDA um, after that, after they make a, the, the committee will make a recommendation, the FDA will decide on this on April 25th. So there's a lot of things to happen, um, but we wanna make sure, again, you all have the opportunity to comment to the 21st, so please do so and take that time today. Excellent. Thank well, you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.